Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again. It's lovely to have your company. I hope you've had a good day. I'm sure it's been a phenomenally busy day. I know mine has been busy, but um, it's great to come together again for another one of our Advice for the Current Times webinars from Discover Education and, of course, our brilliant friends at the NAHT. So uh, just a few little bit of housekeeping. Share your observations and comments on social using the hashtag the whole teacher we tend to use if you'd like to join in the conversation on social. And obviously, if you don't mind having your camera and microphone uh, off, um, but do feel free, as I know you always do. And it's what makes these webinars so special is when you when you contribute your thoughts and you raise your questions for our brilliant, brilliant speakers, who you'll know, of course. Uh, so it's nice when there's a bit of to and fro. We like the Q&A. So use the chat button if you like, or of course, use the actual Q&A button and I'll keep my eye on both. Um, and we'll make sure that this becomes a conversation. But we have a lot, a lot to get through today with our brilliant host, of course, Guy Dudley, who is on the telephone and runs a team, runs a big team at the NHT. who are on the telephone to uh, people like myself and to other people on the call, head teachers of schools across the country and beyond, uh, helping them, as Guy would say, stay in control. I think that's a very important thing, isn't it? Especially over the last few weeks and months, control and certainty are in short supply. So uh, helping us stay on track and stay in control. Guy, I hope you're there. There we are. Fantastic to see you again. Hi, hi, a, hi everybody. Such a friendly, calming presence to be in the company with when you're doing this job. <laughs> I really look forward to these. And and, uh, and I have to say, my notebook is ready, my pen is ready, and I'm ready to make as many notes as everyone else. <laughs> I just happen to be in the lucky position to be able to pose the questions here, but uh, do keep your questions coming in. So, Guy, shall we go through the agenda for today? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, one of the, the, the it's a very difficult time of year uh, for school leaders. Um, people have come back. Uh, I think one of the things that's been in the news uh, that's been particularly newsworthy is the absence of staff and actually how diff how continuing difficulties prevail uh, in trying to manage schools when most of the children are back, um, but a lot of the staff are off. Um, so we felt this was a good time, an appropriate time, uh, to look at sickness absence uh, and how school leaders can uh, best manage it in the circumstances. I'm certainly aware that their schools are getting more requests for flexible working now, probably than ever before. Yeah. And I think the last two years yeah. of anything, um, I think school, anyone who's working in school is probably questioning uh, how to balance their professional and personal life uh, more than ever before. That's good uh, and that can lead on to reasonable adjustments uh, made to uh, working hours, working patterns. Um, and of course, under, underpinning all of that um, is staff well-being. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to dwell too much on that because obviously there's a, a big uh, section on that on pathway. And I think um, I think probably the first three will take up a great deal of our time, but we, we will touch on that. Great. OK. Uh, we, uh... Mention um, risk. Sorry, Andrew, I was kind of managed mm -hmm. manage risk management as well. Yeah. Um, of course, people might think, why have we put these two together? And it's a question I asked myself when I was writing um, a paper. Uh, and just to reiterate to everybody who's tuned in, uh, there will be a paper available on all of what we're going to cover today. Um, but I think school leaders have taken a bit of a step back um, in looking how the, how the last two years have been, the risks that have uh, presented themselves at the school gate with staff, with pupils, with parents, with funding um, and so we thought it would be a good idea as well to close the sort of loop as it were on this particular webinar Andrew with taking a look at risk management um, some schools are looking at it for the very first time yeah. or they're looking at it in a long time um, because life hasn't been the same for the last two years and it's almost been two years since schools closed That's right. for a lot uh, of school leaders, they'll still feel that they're they're going through it, uh, some of the pain as well. So risk management might be a nice way to uh, refresh um, 
uh, any school leader's outlook on uh, on how they manage the school. Absolutely, absolutely, they go together well. I think these. And as you you often say, actually, you've said it to me a few times that in in many ways, the entire job is a process of risk management, isn't it? It is. It is. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we do it all the time in our private lives, don't we? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we manage risk all the time. And yeah. I, I guess where most people might think of risk management is on school trips. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and perhaps when uh, a member of staff declares themselves pregnant, they may do a a desk assessment, a risk assessment at that person's workstation. But we're talking about the bigger picture here, the macro picture. So um, uh, it should be good. Great. Okay, so we'll stop sharing just there. I will jump back in again because I should have mentioned at the beginning that throughout this, we will be sharing some of the brilliant advice pieces that Guy and his team have uploaded to the Pathway website. We're talking, of course, about Discovery Education NHT Pathway, the uh, online CPD program filled with lots of different courses and advice pieces and uh, brilliant stuff on uh, keeping motivated and your career plan. And of course, a brilliant piece from Professor Tim O'Brien about well-being and critical reflection. But there's lots of things that I'm sure you'll know about. But the Advice Hub is at the very centre of that pathway uh, programme. And we'll be sharing some of the pieces, won't we? And then at the end of this, as you often do, I think you'll be putting together a paper that we can share with the attendees. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for those of you who have tuned in, welcome. And, and, you know, everything we discussed today, touch on. Yeah. Uh, will be in, uh, included in a paper that will be available to everybody uh, at the end of the meeting or, or in the next 24 hours. So mm. you can just settle back and, and listen and not have to make notes. Brilliant. Brilliant. Right. So ready when you are, really, Guy? You'd like to start? Well, when yeah, I'd like to kick off with sickness absence. Um, and we've got a piece, folks, in our human resources section of our uh, advice hub. We have. I'll just share that. Yeah. So I'll just share my screen again. Shall I just very quickly share my screen? Absolutely. Just to see that now. Okay. So we're going into um, the reflection section. And if we scroll down, I hope you can see that guy. I can. We're going down to the advice hub, which is what we've just been talking about. And most people will be aware of this, but for those who don't, it's a fantastic treasure trove of many, many, many extensive PDF advice pieces from Guy and his team at the NHT, so you can really rely on this stuff. Um, so, which category are we going to go into? Um, human resources. Human resources. So you'll see, you'll see the extent of this particular shelf, if you like. It's a vast shelf of resources, isn't it? And where am I going to? Which one do you want me to look at? Um, it's a document, uh, unsurprisingly, called Sickness Absence. Sickness Absence. Right, help me here. It's been a long day. <laughs> That's that oh, as well. Um, absence. Uh, there, I think it's. Um, did I see it? Perhaps I didn't. Too many. Uh, too many pieces, aren't we? <laughs> there are an awful lot of pieces on this. Uh, yeah. Oh, I thought I saw it there. Well, don't worry. We'll if you'd like to talk, talk, talk us through what you wanted to suggest, and while you're doing that, I'll have a good look. <laughs> absolutely uh we'll find it in a moment absolutely yeah we've got so many <laughs> what I, what i would like to say to people um is that sickness absence is is one of those areas of management activity where there is very little room for discretion and it's one of those areas where procedure is king um and i'll tell you why um if you're dealing with a sickness absence case, and some of you will be dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment, some are straightforward, some are less so. Um, if that particular case ends in a dismissal on the grounds of ill health capability, and they often do, in my experience, it's only likely to be fair, provided the school has followed a reasonable process. Uh, and normally where there's no realistic prospect of a sustained return to work within a reasonable period. Um, now, I'm not a mad fan of procedure, um, unless it's to do and linked with certain activity. Um, and this is an activity where it is inextricably linked 
Um, so I would say my first tip to everybody on the call would be please have a read of your own sickness absence policy and use these notes to cross-reference it uh, because you may find there are significant gaps in it, uh, especially if it's one from a, a local authority or especially if it's one that hasn't been updated uh, in the last few years. Um, so that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point was that treat all absences as genuine unless they're proven otherwise. Uh, and there's, I've, I've dealt with a number of cases over the years where people haven't treated it uh, as being genuine. They've treated it as being disingenuous uh, and have had their fingers burnt as a school leader along the way. So please treat it as um, genuine. There are plenty of checks and balances in the system and in the procedure um, that will prove otherwise. Um, so, you know, that's a, a really big point to make. The third and final point I'd make, before we just touch on a few of the details, is that most of you will be experts, or all of you will be experts in running a school, or leading a school, or contributing at the most senior level to how a school runs. You're not, or I'm perhaps making a wild assumption, you're not medical ex experts. Um, that's the role of GPs and consultants and occupational health therapists. So, you know, there's plenty of people in this chain of checking and balancing uh, that you can rely upon. The key is to know when to get that advice uh, and how to, how to elicit it and how to act on it. Um, but I think if you follow your policy um, and you, you, know, you really won't go too far wrong uh, at all. If there are disingenuous absences, I um, had a case recently of someone uh, adjusting their sick note, an employee adjusting their sick note, um, and unfortunately they dated the sick note uh, on a Saturday. Um, and on further inquiry, it was discovered that the doctor's surgery wasn't open on a Saturday. Um, so they were banged to rights in simple language, and they were dismissed. Um, so it's a you know it, it's an area that can lead to um, rather unpleasant consequences. Uh, mainly for the employee um, the, in, in, in some cases. So what have, Sorry. <laughs> have you found it? Well, I've found the, the case study ah. document. Uh, okay. Joe's always off. <laughs> well, <there's, laughs> yes. That's not the one you meant, is it? No. Um, yeah. I'll try, and, I'll try and locate it myself. I'll keep playing through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And it's perhaps helpful to think of absences in categories. So, um, and I just want to sort of, you know, give a couple of, of moments here to uh, reflect on those. So an absence could be self-certified uh, from day one to seven. Uh, and absences, sickness absences do include weekends and school closure periods. Um, so that they're a respecter of nothing else other than the cause of absence. Um, from day eight onwards, the employee will need a certificate of fitness to work, or AKA uh, a sick note um, in, in old language, in old money. Um, and then there are short-term absences, which are typically those of up to 20 days, uh, and long-term absences, typically of those over 20 days. Um, one of the things you may find helpful in looking at your sickness policy is to look at the area of frequent short-term absences and whether or not your policy has any triggers. So this is where someone has frequent short-term absences over, say, a school year, um, but there's no uh, trigger or link that can bring all those together. Uh, and in a good policy, and some don't have this at all, but some good policies will have trigger periods of say, five periods of absence in a working period, uh, normally a 12 month cumulative period or continuous period, uh, absence of 15 days. So check on the, the, your policy, whether it has any trigger points, which will help deal with those long-term absences uh, or sorry, short-term frequent absences. 
Your school, I don't know what your school does, Andrew, but um, many schools have access to an occupational health service. Um, not all do, though, which I always find surprising, but often it's through their local authority or the academy trust. Um, so just in case, just because you believe your school doesn't, doesn't mean it doesn't have one. It means that you just may not be aware of it. So again, it may be worth checking uh, your school business leader, checking whether or not uh, your school has access to an occupational health service. And this is a service that you can refer your member of staff to, uh, especially if they've had a series of short-term absences or a long-term absence. Uh, the two critical areas to refer of, of the triggers to occupational health are if someone's suffering from musculoskeletal problems um, or if someone is claiming to be suffering from stress, especially work-related stress. Um, so stress and musculoskeletal uh, issues are particularly relevant for the Occupational Health Service. Um, I think that was all I was really going to say yep. uh, on sickness absence. Uh, okay. And um, what I will do is if we can't locate that document, I will locate it and it will be forwarded on with um, the document that we can send to people afterwards. But my appeal to people would be to take this document that you will receive and cross-reference it with your own sickness absence policy, just to make sure that you've got all the tools you need to deal with what you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Great, thank you very much. And I'm sorry, forgive me for not being able to locate it. We might've saved it using a different title, but we will find it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, staying within the same advice hub section, Andrew, the human resources, mm -hmm. um, I know we have a piece on flexible working. Okay, yeah, I'll just- uh... the next bit we're going to yeah, I'm just going to share my screen again for people to, to see that, if that's okay. Great. So we're on the, uh, I hope you can see that now, we're on the human resources overview again. And we're plowing through this big list of documents that I'm sure if anybody sees a sickness absence, tell me. But um, <laughs> And we're going to go into flexible working here. Okay. So um, flexible working, it's um, one of the most misunderstood uh, areas of activity in, in human resource practice. A lot of people use the word or the terms, Andrew, interchangeably, working flexibly and flexible working. Yeah. Um, and they mean they are two very different things. Yeah. So um, flexible working uh, is, uh, and we've defined it in the, uh, in the paper um, that you'll receive and also our, our document on the advice hub is any arrangement which allows the employee mm -hmm. to vary the amount, timing, or location of their work. It really is that straightforward. So any arrangement which allows employees to vary the amount, timing, or location of their work. Um, so typical examples of that would be part-time working. Yeah. The most typical. Job sharing. Um, there are a number of school leadership posts I know uh, mm -hmm. where there are two heads or two deputies who share a job. Yeah. Um, phasing retirement, where people are slowing down, reducing their hours towards retirement. Uh, staggering hours. Um, compressed hours, where people are working the same uh, amount of their full-time equivalent, but in fewer days. Uh, home working and annualized hours. Um, annualized hours are a little more tricky because they tend to support um, administrative staff. So basically you and the, the member of staff agree a number of hours that that person will work over the year, hence the term annualized hours, and you effectively use it as a currency. Um, so if you agree 500 hours a year, um, you can draw down on that and they can work whenever you need them to. Uh, or they can work at their requests and with your agreement. Um, so it's basically a balance of hours that you work to, uh, to reduce. Um, again, one of the reasons we put flexible working in, Andrew, is that lots of people in the last two years have come yeah. back to school yeah. and they've suddenly had caring arrangements uh, and responsibilities that they perhaps mm -hmm. didn't have 
a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. um, some people have chosen to use this to phase retirement. Um, they've used the two. They've used the two year sort of, if, if you like, sort of unusual uh, circumstances to plan their retirement and plan a career break. Uh, or some people have just taken on different responsibilities elsewhere uh, as a as a, a as a way of dealing with COVID, uh, and they may want to, a, an opportunity to balance their personal and professional uh, responsibilities. Um, do people have a right to it? Uh, no, uh, they don't. Uh, what they do have a right to is ask is to ask for it, um, and they can ask. Uh, casually, informally, um, because they want a temporary arrangement. Um, and that is also a request for a flexible working arrangement, but it's a, it's a casual request. It's what's called a non-statutory request. Um, and that's really very much a, an arrangement that a school leader can have with a member of staff to vary their contract. Um, and they, that can become a permanent arrangement if they wish it to. Mm -hmm. um, however, everyone is entitled to make a statutory request. So this means a request that's made under the Employment Rights Act of 1996. The Employment right, Rights Act of 1996 effectively gives everybody the right to do something. Uh, and that applies to everybody, leaders, admin, support staff, teachers. Um, and they will then have a right to make a flexible working request. Uh, and the school has a responsibility to respond to that request uh, within a set time. Um, the, the reason why it's a statutory request is that there generally is an understanding by the requester and the approver that whatever is agreed is a permanent change to that person's contract of employment. Right. So it's a serious discussion. Yeah. Um, if they don't want it to be permanent, i.e. they want it to be temporary, it's best not to make it under the statutory uh, entitlement, but to make it under the non-statutory entitlement, where it doesn't have to be uh, enshrined in a contract of employment. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the school doesn't want to give it, uh, doesn't want to approve a request for flexible working, the reasons for refusal are, are sort of already stipulated um, in any policy uh, and they can it's almost like a menu of reasons to decline a request right um so the school can pick and choose those um and those again are, are contained in the document that people will get yeah. forgive the language it may um, it may amount to rather commercial uh parlance but uh it's really designed to sort of meet the the, the needs of all employers um it's a it's a tricky one, flexible working request, because if you do turn it down, it, it can sour the relationship uh, at the school. And, and my absolute advice to people is, if you can't agree to it, try and modify the request to something that you can agree to. Yeah. Um, compromise. You know, it's a, a good old British compromise. Mm. Um, mm. But I would just add as a final point on flexible working, and, and there's the, the link to this report in the, in the paper we're sending out, Andrew. Yeah. There was, and it's fairly recent, it's 2019. Uh, there was a huge report done on flexible working in schools. Mm -hmm. um, and the school reported back some huge, the report uh, came back with some really significant advantages. Um, so rather than lose a valued member of staff, schools were able to, you know, adjust their hours right. to retain them. Yes, it left them with a problem because you know, they perhaps have a gap trying to fill the, 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 the hours that that person didn't want to work. Um, but that can easily be filled by someone else. And then you might find yourself into a, a job share, uh, for example. Is there, is because I, I've, I, I'm not here, of course, I would never talk about my school here, but in, in other schools in the past, <laughs> I've inherited, I have to say, a little bit of a patchwork quilt, really, of various different arrangements that have been put in place. And that grows and grows until you end up with something that's really jolly difficult in terms of timetabling, frankly. But yeah. is there a, I mean, can we put a time limit on some of these reasonable adjustments? Yes, I think... Rather than it being a permanent thing. <laughs> no, abs absolutely. I think um, yeah. one of the 
things that I would say to schools, and, and lots of schools have adopted this practice, because you're absolutely right, poor old school leader sits down at the beginning of the year and, and starts planning for the next year, don't they, with budgets and resources, and yeah. almost soon after Christmas, people start to, to do that. Yeah. Um, but one of the, the, the really good tips that the NHT are very fond of, mm. um, and it is just a tip, a recommendation, yeah. um, is that to avoid that fragmentation that you've sort of touched on, yeah. you allow people uh, a term right. in which to make requests uh, right. for the new year. So, for example, you might give them the spring term, um, which is why it's relevant now because we're in the spring term, you might say, right, well, by Easter, I need to know whether or not you have planned, uh, because teachers and other staff have to give the school three months' notice. Yeah. They're in change their arrangements. And those are three calendar months. They don't have to be three school active months. So yeah. it could be July, or, you know, July August. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, mm-hmm. having a, a, an annual sort of, uh, almost like an amnesty, uh, where you say to all your staff, we are very willing to consider all flexible working requests, but in order to assist the school in timetabling and resource management for September onwards, we would ask that all requests are lodged by and put a date on, perhaps 30th of April, um, because the school has three months then in which to respond to that person uh, and that includes the completing the process uh, of discussion, agreement, uh, changing the contract, an appeal, if they were to appeal against the decision. So if you completed it by June, um, you'd, you'd still have a fair crack at being able to plan resources for September. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a really good argument and a good point you've raised there that that does help to avoid the fragmented and timetabling headache uh, that lots of schools um, would face ordinarily. I used to do um, timetabling years ago um, in a school and uh, I would get the whole timetable sort of pretty much drafted and then I'd forget what I always called the R buts. And the R buts are when uh, colleagues will come and say, ah, but I don't, I can't do Thursday afternoons. I did mention that to you. (laughs) Or R but I I need to start late on a Friday because of childcare arrangements. And that's all reasonable, but it's just the R buts that I forgot. And it's getting all of those in as quickly as you can <laughs> from a school, school point of view. you know, but Absolutely. And, and most yeah. people like planning their, their personal lives and their care. So mm-hmm. I think, again, if, if you can try and box them into a reasonable yeah. period yeah. Uh, okay. so by the end of March, April, um, that's good. There are some other challenges, of course, to implementing flexible working arrangements. Uh, and what I was going to just touch on very briefly was Please parental a- attitudes. Yeah. Uh, most parents, um, certainly when they're, they're asked, prefer a single school leader. Yes, they do. Um, or single you know, it's, it's natural, isn't it? You have one leader. Uh, and you've only got to look at coalition governments in, in the past. Not in this country, um, but they've been pretty disastrous in this country. Any sort of coalition government, wherever you want to, to look, has been sort of fairly disastrous. Um, so, you know, I, I think just be aware that there may be one or two parental attitudes out there that uh, aren't necessarily in favour. Having said that, um, we know at the NHT of many, many job share arrangements at every level of management uh, that work perfectly well. Uh, it largely depends on the appetite uh, and the, uh, the general school at- attitude to, to, to flexible working. It's that communication piece as well. If we're looking at continuity for the children, which is our prime concern in a way, really, it, as long as there is active and frequent communication between those job sharing, isn't it? I mean, we're into job shares now, forgive me, but that's sometimes where it hasn't gone well is where they haven't had effective communication in the handover. Um, yes, and I think <laughs> it's um, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I think, you know, whenever I call head teachers and school leaders control freaks, I always get that sort of wry smile uh, back in that sort of a self-admission that yes we are uh, and often the best job shares are ones that where not everything is shared but you actually divvy up divide the responsibilities up um, the only one you can't really divide up is safeguarding that's right um, 
but pretty much think many things can be divided up quite neatly into packages of work uh, and given to those people who uh, you know it would play to their strengths uh, to do so um, I think it can be done it can be done absolutely um, absolutely so we've got a very good piece of flexible working uh, on our advice hub which uh, Andrew's just uh, demonstrated that's right yeah uh, extensive piece actually it, it really is there's a lot here it is and I, I would I would um, encourage people to uh, if you're joining pathway at some point in the very near future I would encourage you to have a good read of that one mm -hmm. uh, I would encourage you to read the sort of if you like the summary of it that I put in the uh, the paper that I'll send you and that's three pages long um, mm -hmm. it's a far more complex area than people give it credit for um, and an area where relationships can be easily soured. Um, but equally, in equal measure, it's also an area of activity where relationships can be enhanced uh, and you can you know, really build strong loyalty from a team uh, if you're willing to share the, the responsibility of, of uh, working together in, and making this work. These pieces, Guy, as with all of your advice pieces, pretty much, you're always inserting the, the, such helpful little hyperlinks to take us out into other sources of information, which means that really these documents are far, far bigger than you might think, because you've got links into all these different places, which is great. Yeah, Saves and, so much time. <laughs> and they work, the links. Uh, yeah. They're all Should checked. We test them? Should we uh, test them? Yeah, let's absolutely. test them publicly. Let's see, let's see what happens. There you go. Yeah, yeah, there you yeah. go. I like to risk things. That was terrific. Straight to it. Brilliant. That's uh, magnificent. Yeah, that, that, you've hit on a good point there, Andrew. I mean, these documents don't only really have value in their own right, but they take you down other little cul-de-sacs, which can be real <laughs> uh, but, 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 but good cul-de-sacs um, uh, uh, that can take you into areas where um, you need to um, perhaps be, be equally capable of having knowledge of that area. Absolutely. Um, Brilliant. So we want to just touch upon uh, the last two parts of this section. One was reasonable adjustments, and that's in the statutes, policies, and regulations. Oh, I'll have a look at that. Okay, I'll get that up ready for you. That's in the statutes and policies and regulations, and it's reasonable adjustments, is it? It's just called reasonable adjustments. Do, 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 do. Uh, now, the reason we've included this uh, particular one, folks, is that um, it, it, it's, it can be a subset uh, of flexible working. Um, and I, what I'd like to encourage people to do is not to think of reasonable adjustments as a burden. There we are. I'll just let Andrew pause on that for you. Whenever I talk to a, a school leader about reasonable adjustments, I do get a sense of how much is this going to cost and do I have to do it? Um, uh, but equally, I get a sense, a positive sense of, I'd love to do something. I'm not quite sure what I can do. Um, I'm not sure how much it costs. Will there be any funding for it? Um, so let me just touch upon some of those for you. Uh, we've given lots of examples of reasonable adjustments for schools uh, in both of these documents, the one that you'll find on Pathways Advice Hub uh, and the one that you'll find uh, when you'll, you open the document that we'll send, be sending to you. Um, do you have to make them is the first question I normally get asked. And no, you don't have to make reasonable adjustments. Um, the, the key thing is, uh, if making them is impractical, uh, prohibitively costly, or where they won't overcome the disadvantage. So just be aware if, the, if you are not going to make them that they fall into one of those three categories. It's impractical, it costs too much, or more importantly, it doesn't overcome the disadvantage that the reasonable adjustment is planned to overcome. Um, do they cost much? They don't have to. Uh, some of them cost nothing. Some of them will cost something. And some of them you'll, there'll be um, funding for. So for example, 
there's a fantastic organization out there, government backed called Access to Work. Um, and Access to Work will provide funding, significant funding, uh, for many uh, of the items, uh, equipment that you might need in order to make reasonable adjustments at your school. Um, so some of these are funded items, which will always appeal to a school leader. Um, so for example, if there is um, equipment uh, required, uh, if there are travel arrangements uh, to be made, um, the, then those are the types of things that can be funded through access to work. Sometimes though, it's not about purchasing of an item. It's just about making sure uh, thank you, Andrew. I can see you've, um, you've tested another one of my links. I'll just uh, pop it in the, into the chat, yeah. <laughs> which works, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but sometimes it's just about agreeing uh, that someone might have paid time off to go to physiotherapy uh, following a, an operation or an accident. Um, it may involve providing an interpreter, a uh, signer uh, for someone with uh, hearing uh, or, or speech uh, impediment. Um, it may involve just modifying the sickness absence triggers uh, that we spoke about earlier um, if uh, the absence is related to a disclosed condition. Uh, so you can begin to see how these areas we're touching upon today start to interlink. Uh, and of course, one major uh, reason of adjustment is to approve flexible working. Um, because it could be somebody may come to you with a whole list of uh, things they'd like, and actually what they're asking for is flexible working. Yeah. Uh, so you may, may sort of uh, turn it on there, uh, turn it into that advantage. Um, two very critical points here, Andrew, before we move on. Um, reasonable adjustments aren't just relevant to staff at the school or people working at the school. They're also... Uh, relevant to those that you invite into the school, right. so visitors, yeah. uh, people who come for interview, mm. and I know that I'm sure that most people would would ask people whether they have any uh, needs on the particular day that need to be met in order for them to participate in the day. But just a helpful reminder: um, where there is a good case to make a reasonable adjustment and failure to do so. Uh, that is likely to amount to disability discrimination. So when someone makes a request, think about it very carefully. Um, if you've got a, not a policy, but you may have something, an appendix, for example, to your health and safety policy or your risk assessment policy. Yeah. Um, this, the reasonable adjustment examples could be, uh, and the do's and don'ts and pitfalls, could be a useful appendix uh, to the, anything the school has in place uh, at the time. So mm -hmm. an important area of activity. Absolutely. Brilliant. So we're looking at wellbeing, I think, are we next? I think so. Uh, for, for the next... Um, Checking the chat. We're okay. The, yeah. Um, I mean, all of this, of course, is underpinned by probably the thing that's been spoken about the most um, certainly, it's been uh, it's a huge underpinning principle of the pathway product it is, yeah. uh, project. Um, it's been the NHT's president's um, sort of hobby horse for the last twelve months, well-being, and rightly so. Um, and you know, all I would say is there are there are three sort of big tips that of all the information I've read about well-being in schools. And I've been reading information about this since 2013. So for almost 10 years, reports that have come out of Harvard Business School, um, Manchester uh, Institute of Technology, um, you name it, I've read them. Um, and there are three overwhelming uh, policies, practices that you, you may want to take out of this. Um, and I've put them in the document. And they are demonstrate your authentic commitment to well-being. And how you do that as a school leader is very much at your discretion. Um, but I think well-being starts at the top uh, of the organization. Uh, put some basic structures in place, like a policy, uh, well-being champions at every level of the organization, perhaps a well-being group. 
and practice what you preach. Um, so I think that comes back to that authenticity. And as part of that, many schools on our advice and on my advice have taken out a staff survey uh, on well-being. Um, and you can categorize findings in things like quick wins, things that can be done very quickly at almost no cost, uh, placing good ideas into your school improvement plan or your Ofsted ready plan, um, or longer term objectives for the school's ethos and culture. Um, you know, I would say well-being is, has been over-engineered in this country over the last 10, 20 years. It is actually very simple. Um, and the, 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 the cogs of it are very, very much uh, in not only the, the document we'll send you, but also in a document we put on the website or put on the Pathway product uh, under the leadership and governance section. And I wanted to place it there because I believe that's where it starts. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'll just, um, sorry, should I just, are you able to pause there while I just show a couple yeah. of bits and bobs on here? Thank you. So I couldn't agree more actually. Before we go there, and we will go to that leadership and governance section in the advice hub, I wanted to just mention the wellbeing program itself, which is also housed within the pathway program with uh, the, the brilliant Professor Tim O'Brien and Dr. Dennis Guiney, two really well-established, and I'm sure you may well know them, very well, very well-known uh, experts in uh, in well-being, um, in human development, um, former um, SEN teachers actually, uh, very experienced, and one is still doing that actually in a school, um, and uh, lecturing in uh, in uh, in human development, psychology, and well-being. And anyway, so this is an amazing course actually that we put together on the Pathway Program. Uh, each of these courses. Each of these uh, sections, if you like, modules within the course uh, has an introduction and then has a film to watch with these various different uh, brilliant experts. So you watch the film and then you read a brilliant, really interesting piece uh, and complete your reflections. And then you move on to the next section, watch, uh, read the introduction, watch the film, a fascinating discussion we had, I remember, um, last year, really interesting discussion about uh, how to really kind of take control of our own well-being rather than uh, perhaps expecting um, others to, to manage it for us. <laughs> this idea of self-management self, self and um, self-control, um, fascinating piece. And then uh, some very interesting thoughts on, uh, on well-being and conducting your own small research project within a school actually on well-being of your own and your com and your colleagues. And then as with all of the different courses within Pathway, and the many, many different courses, you always have the opportunity to write your own reflections. Anyway, we're not here to discuss that. I just thought it would be remiss of me not to mention the well-being programme. Guy, we're going to go to leadership and governance on the advice hub. Is that right? Uh, yes, that was um, that was the section in uh, the staff well-being. And there's the, there's the piece there. Great piece on staff well-being. Uh, which complements the uh, the course from Tim O'Brien really nicely, actually. Um, I, I agree with you, actually. I think maybe it has been over over engineered a little. I think that's a good way of looking at it, actually. It's uh, it's simpler and more basic than perhaps we sometimes think. Uh, what, but we some put, what we have put in the document we'll send you is is what are those basic structures? Yeah. And you know we've we've got nine sort of good areas of practice that you can do as as part of your normal day. Um, one that stuck out for me, Andrew, was one that was sort of was sort of a little bit in the shadows. Um, but I, the more I read read it, the more I thought, actually, I really like that one. And it's keeping messages clear and consistent. Um, people like clarity and the perception of fairness at work is a strong factor in well-being. Yeah, so true. And I, I really like that one. And, and actually, when I look back at some of my favourite line managers, they were the ones who were clear and consistent and fair. Uh, and I felt better working under them. That includes, so my, that includes my current boss, just in case Mark's listening. <laughs> That's so true. I, I, I remember, not in this headship again, uh, this is another school actually earlier on where I was ahead, and I used to sit down, as I'm sure the other leaders on this call will do, uh, regularly with the governor, uh, with the chair of governors, and to go through Ofsted readiness and uh, where we are with attainment progress and just general sort of, and she would have a clipboard in front of her and go through all of the different things that she, as the chair of governance, was required to look into. And I was there being grilled, which is right. 
And then at the very, very end, after what was normally two hours, in the sort of last minute, she'd say, that's all. Oh, and how's your well-being? Okay, good. Right, cheerio. <laughs> Tick. <laughs> so I think we need to pay a little bit more than lip service to it. Um, um, you know what I mean? Anyway, yeah. Um, if we can't uh, practice what we preach, if we can't model it, we're in trouble. We, it starts with us, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I, I think that's why it's important for really uh, people who've tuned in today to know that we've, we've put the basic structures and a little Absolutely. second to practice what we preach in the, in the document. More yeah. importantly, and, and finally on well-being, is we've put a whole side of A4 of, A4 of, of actually school leaders' well-being. Um, I think it's something that school leaders feel that they have to do. Um, and it's, you know, yes, they do. Of course they do. They have a duty of care to all their staff, uh, visitors, pupils, parents, etc., um, but actually, there is a legal duty for them to have a, a duty of care just bestowed on bestowed on them uh, by the governors. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. Um, but it is a statutory right um, for uh, schools head teachers to strike a satisfactory balance between work and non-work activities, um, and you know that's important for of school leaders to know um, there's other little things in there as well that um you know i would i would draw people's attention to uh in terms great of piece it's a great yeah, piece now. i think it's um yeah i think well-being keep it simple keep it authentic keep it going and i think that's the best advice i could give people today and then finally um, we have a relatively new section um, for Pathway, and this is on the administrative and or administration and finance section of our Pathway uh, Hub, mm -hmm. Advice Hub. Um, and of course, we do this all the time. And, and you know, before we came on, I was saying to Andrew, you know, school trips are probably the the, the, the sort of for some schools some of the riskiest activity they take. Uh, and of course, every school trip has its risk assessment continually updated. Um, and of course, schools will, will do risk assessments on uh, staff who are pregnant. They may do desktop uh, risk assessments. So they're doing it uh, all the time, every day. And, and there's the piece that uh, Andrew's just sharing at the moment um, with us. The, the reason why I wanted to link it to today, and as I mentioned right at the beginning, was that I think the last two years have given schools uh, a fresh perspective on running the school and re recognised that actually the pandemic has thrown up, whilst it being a risk itself, uh, has thrown up a whole series of other risks as well in terms of uh, remote learning, um, access uh, into the school, um, and probably relationship with parents. Um, and risk for schools can, of course, fall into safeguarding uh, areas, um, fire, flood, accidents, um, financial uncertainty uh, from a falling role. There is, and I, I, please stay on the document, Andrew, because I, I want to just show uh, viewers in a moment and listeners oh. something in it, if, if I may. Okay. I would just say that there is no one size fits all for risk management. There's no one model that anyone universally agrees on. It's for the school to either have one or not have one. I would suggest they have one. Um, and by saying have one, have a, a risk uh, policy. Um, for academies, it's a requirement, as those of you working in the academies will know. Uh, academies have to make sure that they maintain a risk register. Uh, it's not an option. They have to do it. And they have to include uh, contingency and business continuity planning uh, as well. So there's further responsibilities on those schools. Mm. Um, what, I'd like, what I've done in this document, uh, Andrew, is if, if we scroll down just slowly to the, the first um, picture or diagram, I should say, um, what we've put here is a simple model that schools can follow. This is a typical risk management framework of the 
things that need to get done in any policy framework. Um, so you identify it, you measure it, you manage it, you monitor it, you report it. It's quite straightforward. The rest of the, the remainder of this document um, goes on. And if you could to describe that in more detail, and if you wouldn't mind scrolling down to the next diagram, Andrew, I just wanted to show how, how easy it, or straightforward, that's the one, uh, it is for people to plot risks uh, on scales of likelihood and impact. And you can then start, the, start to show uh, how uh, straightforward it is. Uh, so the likelihood of a school trip risk is, I would say, sort of probably medium, um, but the impact could be high uh, if something went wrong um, rather than medium. So I think that would be a, a red score in every time. Um, and that's why you, you would have a, a thorough risk assessment along with that um, that particular example. Um, a falling roll, um, well, the likelihood of that happening for some schools is very low uh, because they're oversubscribed. Uh, but the impact if it did happen um, could be very high uh, and in fact could lead to a closure, amalgamation. Um, so you can see it, it's fairly straightforward to uh, set up a, a risk register using the red, amber, green, the RAG rating uh, for that. And the last uh, model or, or diagram, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down again, <coughs> is probably my, prefer my preferred model, which is what's called the four T's. Yep. It's also the easiest to remember in many ways and to explain to people. <laughs> Um, so once you've identified a risk, uh, you're now into the control of that risk. Um, and the four T's are tolerate, tri treat, transfer or terminate. So a, a quick example, very quick example would be if you had a particularly difficult member of staff. Um, I mean, I'm talking very difficult member of staff who was uh, a risk uh, to your school in your opinion because you've already identified that. Um, you could then apply those, those four um, possible areas of activity. So you could tolerate their behavior or their performance, which is highly unlikely. You could treat it uh, by um, applying a, an appropriate procedure, whether that's disciplinary or performance related uh, appraisal uh, management. You could transfer it. So could they be transferred? I'm not suggesting you transfer the problem, um, but an example might be, could they be transferred if, if performance was an issue to a role that was more, where, where their capability was more suited to the responsibilities of the role? Um, have they been over-promoted, for example? Um, or you could terminate. Um, you could bring their employment to an end, fairly, of course. Um, and, and you can apply various um, scenarios to that model or, or model to, to various scenarios. And you'll find there's a, just underneath that, there's a sort of sentence of explanation as to which, which each of those are. But um, it's a particularly nice, easy, straightforward one to remember. Whichever one you, you choose will be really down to the appetite uh, of your school um, and in that section we, we carry on around the, the monitoring and regulation uh, and also the common pitfalls that, that people may fall into uh, with risk management uh, and they're important to recognize. Um, I've been, I've sat on a couple of risk management groups in various uh, employments including at the DfE uh, where some of these actually come from. Um, you know, there, there could be too many risks. Yeah. Um, there could be an over-reliance on subjective judgment. So one person on the group has a slightly louder or slightly more volume buttons on his voice than or her voice than mm -hmm. others. Their, their risk is someone else's opportunity. Um, 
But again, the one that I'd like to capture the most is that there's no real buy-in at a senior level. I think most of these activities start at the top. Um, and it's a particularly good area of activity, Andrew. When I say start at the top, I don't necessarily mean with the school leader or leaders or uh, headmasters, head, head teachers. I'm talking about someone on the senior leadership team who can champion this activity. Um, and you know, perhaps head teachers might, may wish to choose it as an area to, to delegate uh, others uh, to. So it is quite a, and, and I guess you, you'd know uh, your senior leadership t team well, you'd know who this would appeal to and probably more importantly, who it wouldn't appeal to. Um, or it may be part of your school business manager's remit, if you have one, school business leader's remit. And if it's not, I think it ought to be. Um, that would be my proposal for you today. If risk management isn't on somebody's job description, uh, and it would normally fall to the school business leader, uh, if your school is fortunate enough to have one, um, then I would very much encourage you to perhaps reflect on that and, and after you perhaps read this document and see what appetite there is for having it in someone's uh, areas of responsibility. Um, risk management, I think it's going to become more common uh, as we go forward. Um, I've just seen, uh, you know, the news day, if anyone sort of watched the news, the big news day is energy prices uh, have virtually doubled. Um, gone up by 70-80% per household or per user. That will include schools. Um, so the costs are going to rocket for schools. And that is a risk um, because schools on a uh, limited budget will have to sort of make decisions uh, unless there's additional funding. Uh, and again, that is a, 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 a real risk for schools, just the general uh, cost uh, of running the school um, and especially when there's severe hikes like the one we've seen today and the impact that's likely to have. So I think it's a really good area to keep on top of. Um, if there are any additions to make to our uh, document, we'll make them before it's released uh, or I'll make them on the Pathway Hub. Uh, but I hope that's a, a really helpful roundup of those particular areas and, and risk management in particular, which I believe will be uh, on, should be on most people's agendas from th this moment onward, Andrew. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Really, really helpful, actually. And I know everybody was listening intently. I'm sure they were. Uh, quick question from Lauren, actually. Thank you, Lauren. Is it possible to change original days agreed for part-time working? What is the notice period? And can an employee say that they will not change, even if this is what is needed to complete the staffing jigsaw? Well, we know about staffing jigsaws. <laughs> what do we think? Good question, Lauren. So yeah, um, two two questions there, Lauren. Rather yeah. cuddly, uh, <laughs> dressed up as one, um, but I, I think the first one: can they be changed? Yes, they can. Um, normally, flexible working requests are only allowed once a year, every yeah. twelve months. So it would depend on whether it's before or after twelve months. But I would say if there's good enough reason to change them before, then it should be possible to do that. Um, if someone's hours no longer fit into the sort of timetabling arrangements, I think the first thing to do would be to sit down with them and just dis discuss with them what's needed by the school uh, and how that you need to address that and whether or not they could um, adjust their part-time working. I guess you won't know until you ask them. Um, but it's entirely possible to have both of those discussions if the person refuses and says, no, I'm not changing my part-time hours, um, you wouldn't be able to change their particular contract if, it, if the changes were enshrined in the contract of employment. Um, you'd then potentially uh, be potentially be in a redundancy situation uh, if the school's needs overrode those of the employee. Um, so I, the, the employee would no longer be required to provide that, um, that teaching and learning within the hours that were needed by the school, which would be a legitimate reason to consider redundancy. But as that's the action of last resort, I think dialogue ought to be uh, the action of first resort. 
Well, um, I think... And then see whether either of you can modify your positions to achieve an outcome. That's brilliant. And it's a nice segue into Naomi's comment. Thank you, Naomi, for, for adding. I hope that was good, uh, useful, Lauren. I'm sure it was. But Naomi's uh, popped a comment in. I had a member of staff arguing custom and practice, and I was able to prove that the school's needs meant that they couldn't continue to work in their accepted or established pattern. Mm. Uh, it obviously didn't, didn't, uh, didn't suit the school. No, I mean, ultimately, the needs are always going to trump those of the employer. Yeah. Uh, they just have to. Yeah. But I think it's for the school to make a good case for that. Yes. Which is why those reasons that, that, that when we talked about flexible working, those yeah. are there are eight reasons that are set yeah. out by law yeah. that they, these are the legitimate reasons that you can refuse. Yeah. And part of those is actually to one of those is to actually to provide the service that you're there to provide, in Absolutely. which in your case would be education. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, I don't know about everyone else, but I've got a meeting I'm going to go to. <laughs> Parents are in, uh, as they often are. So, uh, but yeah, so thank you so much, as always, Guy. It's just a pleasure. Always brilliant to see you and to hear your absolute nuggets, pearls of wisdom. Um, I hope you're able to see that the screen. Um, if you'd like to find out more about Pathway, um, we've talked a lot about that today. Visit the URL there, discovereducation.co.uk forward slash pathway, and you'll find out all you need about that. And we are going to see Guy again, and I'm so pleased, Tuesday 9th of March at four o'clock. And I know he'll already be preparing lots of information, probably already started actually, um, that be <laughs> mind you it's always very very up to date as well isn't it so you can't really start it too early because it's always hot off the press um, but hours and hours go into preparing for these webinars not from me but from Guy and, um, and that show so thank you so much and I hope uh, I hope you have a, good, a great evening and uh, we'll see you again on the 29th of March if not before thank you very much take care <laughs> thank you